Hey everyone. Hello. I'm Dave. I'm Rick. And welcome to Byerly RV University. How how we do it, right? How we do it. How we do it. So tonight we're going to go over, like when you come into Byerly and you pick up a new camper, um, before you leave, we take you outside and we go around the inside and the outside and show you how to use everything. And we're gonna kinda do that just on camera tonight. Um, but before we do that, first I just want to say thank you very much for watching. Uh, we are currently streaming live on YouTube and Facebook, so uh, welcome to both parties here. Hello to everybody. Yep, and uh, we have a couple drawings we're actually going to get out of the way first here. So here at Byerly, we tend to do like a monthly drawing over in the parts department. You can come in and enter. You might enter it online. Um, in December, it was for a $250 gift card. And for those of you that don't know, this uh, the entry thing sits right in front of the parts desk. So you should enter when you come in. And everybody who entered in December is right here. And so what we're gonna do is we're gonna draw, we're gonna say first name, last initial. We have your information, we're gonna get a hold of you. So the $250 gift card winner is? Brandon G. Brandon G, all right. We'll say from Arnold, that'll help. Yep, for Bart. Yeah. We can do that. Yeah. And. Uh, so hey, Brandon, congratulations, dude! Two hundred fifty dollars at the parts store—that is awesome. Nice. Um, yeah, right. and uh, so that. So, and now we've got another one. I don't know what yeah. we're giving away in January. I don't know, Cody. We don't know. It's okay. You got to come in to find out, right? <laughs> <laughs> now moving over here. So today, okay, real quick, you guys. I guess uh, what you see going on over here. We are currently doing our expo. So this is the pre-show expo. It's today, which is Thursday, January 12th. Uh, tomorrow is Friday the 13th. All yes, right. Uh, what, no better. You know what? Part of buying an RV is a good story. So buying it on Friday the 13th is probably a good thing. And then uh, on Saturday the 14th, guys. And the expo is pre-show pricing. The whole idea with this is you can come down here. You don't have to pay to park. You can. There's no admission fee. You can shop everything on the lot and get great pricing. You can play our game. This is called Not Plinko. And then we've got uh, you, prizes you can win and everything if you can come out tomorrow or Saturday if you're watching this live or if you're watching this on Saturday the thir Friday the 13th or Saturday the 14th. Come on out, you guys. Now, today, for everyone that came out, you were able to come over here and win a prize and we, you got a little gift card, but you also got to enter in to win this Rhino tote tank right here, all right? So this is a 36-gallon tote tank. This is like about as good as it gets. The thing is absolutely humongous. Um, and we have folks right here, and Rick is gonna draw, guys. There were not a lot of people in today, so I hope you're watching because uh, you have a very, very, very good, good chance of winning. And again, we'll so. do first name, last initial, and our winner right. is. So, we have Fran N, and she didn't say where she was from. That's okay, Fran, you know who you are, but hopefully. We have her phone number so we can reach out to her and call her and tell her that she won. Yeah, congratulations, guys. And now tomorrow, we're, you know what? I don't know what order we're doing this in. Tomorrow, I think we're doing satellite. And then Saturday's the bike. That's right, yeah, right? Yeah, the, so the yep. bike was the big one, I believe. So tomorrow, if you come in tomorrow and shop, you can enter to win this dish tailgater system. And if you come in on Saturday and shop, you can oh, enter to win. Do huh? all these carry through? No, no, nope, it's every so day. These so these are today. gone. This was right. today's. And we start over fresh tomorrow. Um, you can come out and enter again. That's totally fine. Yeah. And then we'll do the bike on Saturday, guys. Um, so we will do drawings tomorrow and Saturday live on Facebook. Okay, so if you are watching on YouTube and you have not followed Byerly RV on Facebook, if you do that, you'll be able to see when we go live and do things like that. Um, some of you got here right now that way. So yeah. thank you for that. We appreciate that. And listen, guys, if you like this type of stuff, please, um, especially on the YouTube channel, if you haven't already done so, please subscribe. We hit our 2,000. Thank you very much for our first 2,000 subscribers. We nice. really appreciate that. Um, we are looking forward to growing the channel even more. Um, so if you haven't already done so and you like this type of stuff, make sure you're subscribed. Click the bell icon. You'll be notified when we go live like this. Um, things like that. Yep. So, right? So should we actually talk about like RVs, and, like an RV or something maybe? Nah, I think we just turn everything off and go home now. Yeah, we're good. <laughs> Guys, uh, we're going to do, so last year um, we did a travel trailer called a Passport. Yep. And this year we're going to do a travel trailer called a Novo. And it's a little bit different. Yep. Um, and as we go through, we will point you back at last year's videos for some things. But this thing, this, this yep. vehicle has some things on it that we want to show you that are becoming more and more common. It's like, you know, if there's one thing, things change in our yep. business. Yep. And um, this one has some stuff we want to show. So, uh, but if you think, if, if there's anything that we've missed or that you feel like we might have skipped over a little bit, just refer back to the 2021, 2022. Yep. 
um, or if there's class. anything specific that you want to see, send a question in. Not tonight. Anything you want to know. We're not doing questions? Nope. Sorry. Right, never mind. Well, just tonight, the way we're, we're live in the showroom, Michael's actually up in the uh, studio, and we don't have the ability to relay questions. I do apologize. Thanks for mentioning right. that. So um, feel free to e yep. email stuff. You can call Rick. <laughs> no, but feel free to uh, email in a question, and we can certainly address those or hit them next time or whatever. Or we can contact you personally. It's not a problem. So uh, we are available. We are here every day. This is what we do. We pulled Rick out of the shop. He has worked all day long, and now he's going to do this. We're going to start right up front, you guys. <laughs> uh, we'll go around the front. Uh, we'll go on the outside first and then the inside. That way we don't miss anything, right? And uh, we'll be talking about operational stuff, so we're not going to talk about things like what kind of tongue jack this particular trailer has, because that's not what we're doing here. We are talking about things like the propane, though. Yeah. And uh, something to notice right here is that this is a single bottle propane system, and this is where I just want to make sure that last year's was a double bottle, yeah. right? Yeah. And so if you wanted to see that auto switch over, check out last year's video. Um, you'll see why we're doing this one in a few. But let's talk now propane this, a little bit. This is a 20-pound bottle, and I think you can upgrade to a 30-pound on it. But other than that, there's not a whole lot you can do to upgrade this. Right. Uh, because and, of the battery and the, and the ton positioning of stuff on here. And honestly, guys, I, I will be, uh, my, my camper has one bottle, and it lasts a lot longer than I thought it would. But it's a small camper, so it's got a small furnace. <laughs> so it doesn't, you know, I've got things like electric water heater and stuff. And if you're not running the furnace all that much, it, you know, the propane will last for a while. Yeah, you know, there's certain things in the camper that run on electricity, certain things that run on batteries, certain things that run on propane, right? Yeah. And, you know, what Rick mentioned right there, the furnace, by far, it uses more propane than everything else combined on the thing. Because realistically, in the summertime, you know, like this camper, the one last year, they both had electric water heaters. I mean, this is very common. And you get to the campsite, what do you do? You turn on the electric, right? Because you already paid for your electric. Right, right. You know, and so I'm using electric to heat my water. I'm not running my furnace. My fridge now is like, what, maybe DC? You know, I mean, it's like it, it doesn't need propane yeah, like or I'm plugged into electric. Fridge in this, yeah, it's like a right. compressor fridge. So. so really, in the summertime, what? I'm using my propane to cook yeah. with. Yeah, exactly. And that's about it. Exactly. You know, and, and if you do, you know, if you do use it to heat the water uh, in those instances where you're trying to recover the hot water quicker or something. I do that when I shower. It's, it's minimal. It is. I mean, it's unbelievable how long this thing will last yeah. uh, in the summertime. And I do that. We'll get. To, we'll talk about water and stuff. But um, when we get to the water here, but I, I, I turn on the propane when I'm going to shower. It's absolutely amazing. This little how... thing's probably got a twenty thousand BTU furnace in it. Yeah. Um, just to to get a, a, wrap your head around how long that tank would last. Um, Eighty one thousand BTUs an hour uh, per gallon of LP. Oh wow! All right. So theoretically, your furnace could run for two hours and only use one gallon of, of LP. And that's continuous running. You know, that first yeah. time that we got that cold snap yeah. early, before Thanksgiving, yeah. I went out to my camper and I turned on the furnace and opened my cabinets and stuff. Mm -hmm. And that bottle lasted two days. Yeah. When I was, I mean, it was amazing. Yeah. I didn't expect it. I mean, I just, it was yeah. amazing. And, and that was running like almost all the time. And stuff set at, you know, yeah. the furnace may only run for, you know, 10 or 15 minutes an hour, yeah. you know, in actual run time. So, mm. you know, you figure at that, at that kind of rate, yeah, that, that 20 pound LP bottle is going to last for, it, for quite a while. It lasted a lot longer. And guys, a 20 pound bottle is nice and convenient. It's convenient to carry an extra one if you want to. Mm -hmm. Um, if you need to purchase one, it's convenient. You can't buy a full 30-pound bottle at the gas or at the grocery store, but I can buy a full 20-pound right. if I needed it, you right. know, and just drop it right in. I don't know that I'd trade the bottle that my camper came with because my camper came with a brand new bottle, and it's my bottle. I'm keeping that bottle. But if I need another bottle, I'll just buy one at the grocery store, and I'll keep that as my trade-out one, yeah. you know. Uh, but um, yeah. So now behind that, on this one, we have a battery, yeah. right? So this is the battery that we. Put on a camper, just a basic battery when yep. you pick it up, Standard right? Standard 80 amp, amp hour battery. Lead acid, yep. right? Our, a deep cycle. Yeah. So, you know, it's, it's, it's the basic battery that we've used forever. Um, and realistically, until you start getting into, you know, if you're a camper that is going to campsites most of the time and electric sites most of the time and everything like that, and this thing is being maintained by your vehicle when it's going down the road, if you have a charge, you know, just... This battery is sufficient for most of us. Yeah. Um, really, until you start getting into serious boondocking, which we'll do a whole class on and stuff, um, you know, it, it's pretty, I mean, it's, for me, it's been sufficient yeah. for the most part. You and know? the great thing about this battery, we, uh, about, 
about a year ago, we switched over to uh, using AC Delco batteries uh -huh. from the company we was using. Yep. So these batteries now have an 18-month warranty. Oh, good. And you can get them replaced at pretty much any kind of a GM dealer or okay. anybody that sells AC uh, Delco parts. Nice. So, and or at least the the AC batteries. Is this maintenance free? Yes. Yeah, that's a big difference too. I don't have to check my water levels anymore. Yeah. So that's uh, if you have an older battery, guys, or a uh, there's a lot of batteries out there, a lead acid battery that does have caps on the top, especially deep cycle batteries. Yeah. A deep cycle battery, this is a different battery than what's in your car. Right. All right, so your car battery, every single time you turn it on, it, it uses a little battery to start, and then it gets charged right back up right away by the alternator. So the thing never really gets that low. When it does, it's like really bad for it, frankly. And this thing here is made to be discharged and recharged and discharged and recharged. It's the deep cycling of this battery is not going to hurt it's it. It's got heavier plates in it. And that would so, be why. See, so, <laughs> a, a starting battery is made for a huge shot of current at the time that you, you hit that starter motor, uh, whereas these are made for a more constant amount and much less uh, current level. So they discharge slower and they recharge uh, with a higher rate of recharge than, than a car battery will. Gotcha. So, now, a couple things. Um, one of the reasons why we're looking at this vehicle is it does have a solar package on it. And we're going to talk about that more. But if you have a solar panel now, one of the best things your solar panel does is actually just keeps the battery charged, frankly. Because <laughs> uh, almost any panel will do at least that when you're not using the camper. Um, but it's supposed to. Wait a him. <laughs> now, the thing is, when you're not going to use it, when you're parking your camper and you're not going to use it for a while, you do need to disconnect the battery. Otherwise, there are things in here that will draw it down. There's a, there's a propane gas detector in here. It's hardwired. If the battery's connected, the detector is on, and it will eventually run your battery down like a dome light would. Yeah. You know? If it's, I if mean, it's got a radio in it, it's going to have some kind of memory service. The fan in, in the converter will run, even if, it, if uh, the temperature gets too hot in here, won't it, or no? No, it shouldn't. Okay. Um, it now, only run when it's got AC. this vehicle here has got a battery disconnect right here, which is nice, but the rest of us would just take this off and take one of these battery cables off. Yep. And that's how it sits, and then the next time I'm going to use it, you know, typically the first thing I do is I'll connect my battery, and then I'll open my propane, and then I'll start getting the rest of the camper ready. But when it's been in storage, they, these are the first two things I do, and then I can get everything going, right. you know. Um, it, are we still are we putting batteries inside when it when it's cold out? We uh, yeah, I still recommend them. If you're storing it for the winter, yeah, I highly recommend you take the battery off and take it inside. Yeah. So and we've always kind of done that, but I just want to mention that, right? Yep. Now we'll head around this side, you guys. Um, this vehicle has four of these scissor jacks. Okay, these are called stabilizer jacks. They're stabilizer jacks, not leveling jacks, right. and that is Very important. important. <laughs> it really is, because the thing is, is these jacks. And I did this, you guys, seriously. I, the first camp I ever bought, no joke, the first trip we ever took, we go down to Branson and we're camped like on the side of a hill. And I used, I had no instruction, mm -hmm. and I used these. And it took me like a half hour to get them all. I finally got this thing level, dude. Yeah. And then I went and I, my door was open, and I took the door and I went like this, and it goes whang, and it wouldn't even close because I had, <laughs> I, had, I had tweaked my floor, you guys, yeah. so out of whack that the door wouldn't even close anymore. So the point where I'm going with that is, is that you level your camper first. A trailer like this, we level it with, if we're off side to side, we'll use some blocks under the tires. Yeah. And then once we're level side to side, we'll hit the tongue jack and get front to back level. Right. And then once you're level. Then we put them down. Right, and we just snug them up and we don't run them down like we're changing tires in NASCAR. Run them down just at a normal speed. They'll last a lot longer. Sure. You know. And what they're, what they're there for, the real reason they're there, is to keep the bounce out yeah. of the trailer when you're moving around. And that's it. When you snug it up, and I say just snug it up, we're not cranking. We're yeah. snugging it up. But then what happens is we are no longer sitting on springs. Right. We're just sitting on four jacks, and we have a nice, solid floor to walk around on. You know? um, and uh, that's it, it. there's other additional stabilization options for folks that feel like they need more. So okay. that, that's available too. Uh, but level first, then stabilize. Right. Now, of course, we are doing a walkthrough on this trailer. You might have a motorhome that has a button on it that you press and it levels itself automatically. You right. might have a fifth wheel that does that, and you might even have a trailer that does that. If that's yeah. the case, congratulations. Yeah. <laughs> and that's a separate video in itself yeah. on the operation of that system. Yeah. Uh, but um, they, it, that is available. One of my monthly tips, I think we did do that. I think you did, yeah. yeah. So. so check out the web, you know, check out our YouTube channel for other helpful tips, short videos, product walkthroughs, and everything. So. 
Um, now, next thing here is our, uh, our water system. Yep. Right? So, so we got a city water connection there, which is just hooking the hose to, and then you go in and use your fixtures inside, just like you would if you were at home. Wow, we should have brought hoses out. Yeah. Anyway, so we, <laughs> we use a white hose because it's a food grade hose, right? right? And then it's, it's just like a garden hose and it screws in here. And your campsite's gonna have like a, yeah. a, a garden hose connection. Yeah. Hose bib. Right. Standard. Yeah. Household hose bib. Now, we usually use a water pressure regulator. Right. Right. You know, because here's the thing, you guys. You go to a campground, it's got 200 campsites, right? So you open the water deal, and water comes out so hard it's making a crater in the ground because they are pressurized right. for 200 people right. at one time, right? This yeah. doesn't 40, want that, right? PSI. That's what it wants. What? What's well, 40 PSI? Hear that? So that's what we the have, regulators are set at. Yep. So that's what. So what you get is you get a little regulator and you put it on the spigot over here and you run your hose over here and then but it's all nice and even pressure and it's good. You don't overpressurize your plumbing system. Right. So it's a little and thing, things but blow apart inside. Right. <laughs> you know. Um, now that's for when you're at a campsite that has a water spigot that you can connect right. to and leave it connected, right? Right. But a lot of times we go away. We don't have one, right? Yeah. So then what? So we have a way to put fresh water and carry it with us. So we just put a hose in here and we fill it up until the monitor panel inside says full, not till we have water coming flowing out of there like it's, you know, Niagara Falls. So he does that. <laughs> hey, listen, seriously though, I do turn that water down when I know it's getting full because if you have a hose jammed in here and it's on high, you can bust your tank, okay? Yes. If you pull the hose out and it's shooting water four feet out for like 20 seconds, you shouldn't you, do that. You have pressurized <laughs> the inside of your tank. You've, over, yeah. you've overfilled the system. Yeah, it's there plastic, be, there man. There should be an air gap in the top of the tank, yeah. all right? Yeah. And it should not be coming out up here. Yeah. Please, yeah. don't fill it. Don't put your hose in there. Walk away and wait to water us, you know, spewing into the neighbor's yard before you come over there and turn it off. Yeah. You know, the, till the monitor panel says it's full. No, just trying to do get. Do that when you get to the campground also. Don't yeah. do that before you yeah. leave. You don't want to. Don't drive. travel with full water yeah. tank if you can avoid it. Yeah. It's it, heavy. It puts stress on the, on the frame of the unit, yeah. for one. Yeah. And put stress on the tank. Yeah, it's a plastic tank. But it's also X amount of extra weight <laughs> that it, you don't have to pull behind you. So don't yeah. fill the tank until you're, you know, at or near. Well, where it's also you're unstable camp. weight. It moves. Mm -hmm. I mean, a tanker truck when it stops, it all still flows back and forth, and that's what your water does too. But, you know, you guys, it's hard enough just to get a replacement tank. Putting it in is a whole nother deal. This yeah. is not something you want to have to do. So this is something, this is preventative. We do this right on the front side so that we don't have to do major thousands of dollars of repairs on the back side. Um, oh, and yeah, it was 8.3 pounds a gallon, yeah. or something like that. And this thing has, this one has a 30 gallon tank. A lot of them have 40 gallon tanks. And, it, and realistically, it's a plastic tank with like maybe two little lips that it's hanging on. I mean, it's just not something you want going down the road. And so most campsites mm -hmm. are gonna have a place where you can stop and fill the water before you actually park, right? And then um, on that note, when you're done, if you have water in the water tank, you should probably drain that before you park this thing because you don't want water to sit in there and go stale. So there is a, uh, underneath here, there is a, this one has just a place where you can screw a cap on and off, and it's just a, what we call a low point drain. And I always drain my fresh tank yes. um, at the end of a trip, and I actually usually drain the, the water, water heater, yeah. you know. Highly recommended, especially if it, especially in the summertime, drain the water heater out, you know. You don't want, you don't want that water just sitting in there stagnating. I will never forget the day I was working in parts, this was like 10 something years ago and I smelled the most horrible smell at the counter. I mean, the most horrible sulfur rotten egg smell I have ever smelled in my life. And it was Rick outside the building, four bays down the building, draining a water heater that, that somebody had left the water in. Oh my gosh. For, for like half the summer. Dude, it was the worst smell I've yeah. ever smelled. And I don't think oh, there's any way terrible. of ever getting that out of there. But I'll never forget that because I'm like, it, it, you were out there. It was just horrible. You'll, you'll get it <laughs> out, but it takes, you know, like pure chlorine. To Holy do it. cow, so, man. So anyway. <laughs> this, is, this is the Suburban. Uh, it's got the anode rod. Uh, if you have the, the uh, Atwood or Dometic brands, you'll have the little drain over here on the side. So. Yep. And so you'll need a tool. 
Yeah. You know, this is an inch and a sixteenth socket, and then the uh, the Dometic cat wheels yeah. are, are uh, fifteen sixteenths. This is the one that'll be in your set, and that one you'll have to go buy. Yep. <laughs> you might as well buy the five pack because with the single ones, anyway. This particular <laughs> water heater does have uh, the electric element in it. Uh, at a suburban, there'll actually be a switch out here in the in the outside that you can turn on to turn that element on and off. And when we go inside, we'll see the switch for the propane. So, so, but out here, this is, you know, this is supposed to look like this too. Every once in a while, I get concerns from folks that are like, oh, it's got corrosion, oh, it's got rust. Oh, this is totally normal. This is outside, exposed to the elements. It's meant to be this way. It's yeah. going to look this way. It's, it's fine. It's galvanized yep. steel. You know, so, yeah. It's and, and the draining is simply just removing the plug. And then, like we do, we'll just set it right in here like that and close it and leave it open and empty till next time. Yep. You know, um, and uh, you can watch Rick, Rick's winterizing video if you want from a couple of months ago uh, as far as the details of how to actually winterize this. We're not going to talk about that. Uh, you can put screens over these yep. to help keep uh, wasps and other bugs from getting in there. Um, Furnace exhaust gonna, is next. When you, when you turn, <laughs> yeah, when you turn the uh, when you turn the water on, you're going to flush that out before you put the uh, yeah. put the plug back in it anyway. So even if something were to just get in the tank, all you're going to do is flush it out. So did you catch that? So when you go, I'm getting my camper ready. It's time to get it ready. I've had this plug out. It's been sitting open and empty. I will hook up some water and let this run and just rinse out a little bit and then stick the plug in. If it's been a while, if you're worried about it, you know. Um, and then I mentioned furnace. We'll do tires in just a sec, but while we're on the subject of screens, because out here it's just a furnace exhaust. Right. Most of the furnace is inside, um, but uh, this is where hot air blows out, but this is probably the most, I think that's the most important thing to screen personally. Uh, yeah, we just, uh, one, of, one of the techs uh, took one out yesterday that a customer brought in. It was blowing a fuse. And uh, when he took the furnace out, it, it had all it had was the access out here. It didn't have the, the door, so he had to take it out from the inside, which automatically adds about an hour of time At least. to a furnace job. But 150 the, bucks. The entire exhaust side of that furnace just was caked with mud. Yeah. Mud daubers. Yeah. So see, the thing about the furnace is this: is that we don't use it all summer long. And so they will go up in there, they will build nests, and then you don't figure it out until you go fire it up in the winter and it doesn't work. Yeah. And then you're in here paying these guys $150 an hour. $165 an hour now. There you go. Yeah. And it's going to take them three or four hours to do this. Okay. And so a simple 20 something dollar screen on this will keep that from happening. Yeah. Um, it is a given. It should be on there. Yeah. Um, Might just save you a lot of money. Yep. 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 Uh, now, let's talk tires. tires. Uh, just, you know, this is, this particular one has these off-road looking things, but the reality is, is that, you know, your trailer is probably just going to have some normal trailer tires on it. What are, what are your recommendations for tires? So, uh, tires are going to be uh, about five years, uh, five to seven is what the, the general rule of thumb on it is. Uh, for replacement, we don't worry so much about tread wear on these tires. Uh, we're more worried about the condition of the inside of the tire. So when you get into that five to seven year range, you're gonna start getting probably some dry rot on them yep. from setting and stuff like that. And that's why they're recommended to be changed at those intervals. Um, now these are Goodyear tires, so they're a little bit better grade of tire than we might see on some, tire, on some of the campers. Um, but still, you know, they're, go they're gonna be something that I'm gonna look yeah. at five to seven years. Um, and it's, you know, guys, so, we don't, it's not like your car. We're not going right. to put enough miles on this thing to wear them down. Yeah. I mean, your car, you look at them, they got wear marks on them. It's like time to get new tires. Yeah. That's probably, if you somehow put that many miles on your trailer, good for you. Yeah. For the other 99% of us, we will not wear this down. If you are getting a bunch of tire wear, you have a problem. If you, you, if you, you put 10,000 miles on a trailer in five years, you're probably doing a lot of camping. Right. You know, you know? and, so and, and even that, think about that, 10,000 miles. 50,000 yeah. mile radiant on it. But it's the stuff you can't see. Yeah. It's, there's a trailer tires. This is not a balanced tire or anything like that. Right. It is just back here. You, we use only, you know, in the old days, there used to be, uh, what, bias play, or, uh, bias, play. bias play, which we don't do anymore. Right. All radials now. Yeah. Um, but the tires are something. It's just, you guys, if you have a blowout, literally, this tire blows out, it can take out this whole side of the camper practically. I mean, it can be thousands of dollars in damage. It will definitely damage. take out everything that yeah. is in this section of the camper right above the tire. Yeah, so it's, 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 it's,
is truly just completely destructive yeah. and it will happen at the worst possible time. You will be at the worst possible place yeah. and you can avoid that by just every five years. Just replace the tires and you're good, you know. What about tire pressure? Tire pressure is recommended by the manufacturer. That sticker is located on the front of your camper. I always recommend that we use this, whatever this number is. Um, a lot of trailers, it's 50, some it's 80. Um, just depends on the size of the tire and the weight rating of the camper uh, that's gonna determine it. But the manufacturers put it on that sticker right up here and that's what we wanna use. Thank you. Yeah, that's something that a lot of people, I don't necessarily know that that information is right there. Just like on the inside of my car door, on the camper, it's right up there. Yeah. Oh, and then, um, Bearings, brakes, yeah. axles, all that stuff. Uh, lug nuts, every trip you should hit the lug nuts and make sure they're tight. Um, there's various different uh, torque specifications on various different trailers and they're all different and I don't know what the one specifically for this one is, um, but you should be able to get that from the manufacturer or base it on the stud size, which we can tell you that kind of stuff um, if you just ask. So as far as axles, brakes, um, and uh, your bearing repacks and stuff like that, approximately every 3,000 miles is kind of the, the general rule of thumb on a, on a bearing repack. And uh, hmm. then when they do the bearing repack, they'll check and adjust the brakes as necessary. Uh, and make sure that the suspension and everything is in good shape. So I'm making a mental list of the things I need to do while we're doing this. Because <laughs> <laughs> that's one of them. <laughs> so. Well, and that's another one of those things, you guys. And we see it here too often because we're on the highway. I mean, you spin a bearing, basically the bearing just stops being a bearing and it just welds together. It's just the yeah. messiest tour. And again, this will happen at the most inconvenient time and or, location. Yeah, or the spindle just breaks and <laughs> that the tire too, becomes you know? a projectile going down yeah. the highway passing you. Yeah. Oh, and by the way, it's going to be 110 days till we get your axle. So. Yeah. <laughs> so again, you know, I would say the preventive maintenance, you guys, is more important than it's probably ever been now. Oh, yeah. Just because we've had so many challenges in the industry with getting yeah. parts and stuff like that. You want to take care of your stuff. The last thing you want to do is have to order something. Yeah. Okay, so now we get to the fun part here. We're going to talk uh, tanks. We're going to talk dumping tanks. We talked about the fresh, so there's the plumbing system here. We've got a fresh tank for fresh water, and then we've got a gray tank that holds our soapy water from our sinks and shower, and we've got a black tank that holds the waste strictly from the commode. Okay, and we use a chemical in the black tank. It treats the waste. It controls the odor. We use special RV toilet paper. It breaks up into little bitty pieces in there. Like if you put a square of it in a jar and shook it up, it'd break up into little bitty pieces. So that helps this empty out. Okay, because gravity is what does the work here. When we go inside, you're going to see a monitor panel on the wall. We'll show you that, and it'll show us how full our tanks are. We do like to have the, and, and then when it's time to empty the tanks, you, it's, the more full your black tank is when you empty it, the better, because the more it's going to help it wash out and, and, and go, right? And um, we're not going to obviously demonstrate that right here, but it's not hard. And for those of you that may have never done it, it's really not that bad. There's a cap right here, and I pull this cap off right here, and there's a convenient bumper on the back that I can store my hose in. I'm going to take the hose out and I'm going to put it on here and I'm going to run the other end over. Typically at your campsite you're going to have like a piece of PVC sticking out of the ground. That is your dump. Now it's not uncommon for that piece of PVC to be sticking up about like that, right? And then your hose wants to go down and over like this and up. Okay, so that little slinky thing that goes under your hose, that, I use that, man. That, that really works because it doesn't flow uphill very well. <laughs> so <laughs> it is better to have the slinky thing. So I would set all that up here and put that in. I'm not in contact with anything. Yeah. And then I'm going to dump black tank first and then gray. And there's valves down here. I'm not going to pull that right now because there's antifreeze and stuff in there right now. But it's just a blade. It's a pull push. Mm -hmm. Pull the black tank. I'm going to let it drain. I'm going to hear it. Now on a regular camper, I'm just gonna let that drain. I'm gonna close the black tank, I'm gonna open the gray tank. Now my soapy wastewater from my sinks and shower is gonna flow through that hose and help to kind of clean it out. You're not gonna eat out of it, but you'll put it back in your bumper. Okay, but uh, it helps to clean and wash that thing out. All right, now on that note, as soon as I've dumped that black tank, that's when I'm going back in. That's when I'm putting more chemical down the toilet and a little bit of water in there so it's ready to go for next time, okay? Yeah, now. Before. For the rest, for this particular camper has a black tank flush out, 
All right, so like I just said, my regular camp, I don't have this. I dump my black, I dump my gray. Okay, I'm basically ready to go for next time. Never, ever open the black tank and just leave it open, okay? Because the way that tank works is we put a chemical in the tank and as you use it, it fills up, the chemical does its job, it breaks down the waste and everything. And then when we pull the valve, it all empties. If you leave the valve open, literally, every time you flush the toilet, it will rinse out any liquid that might be in there and it will leave a pile of solids in the middle of that tank and it will ruin it, okay? And I'm not even gonna go into how nasty of a job that is to clean that out and you don't wanna have to do that. Again, at the most inconvenient time. Um, so even though you'll see people at a campsite and this thing is sitting there and it's hooked up and it's hooked up the whole time they're there, we're still coming out and dumping that black tank when it's full. Right. You just gotta pull the valve and close it. A gray tank, a gray valve, you could leave that open if you want, but depending on their plumbing system and your plumbing system, you can get odor, actually. So I don't know that I'd even do that nowadays. <laughs> but um, but uh, this particular camper, what Rick said, a black, has a black tank flush out. So with a camper that has a black tank flush out, it just changes my order of operations slightly. It doesn't really change, it just adds in a step. Hook up the hose, mm -hmm. open the black tank, let it drain, and with the valve open, I'm gonna take another hose, not my drinking water hose, but a separate hose, and I'm gonna connect that from my spigot to this black tank flush out. And then I'm gonna turn this thing on, and it's gonna sit there, and if you could, it's like a dishwasher spinner kinda of inside, it's gonna rinse and spin, and just, it's gonna rinse out that tank, and I have a clear elbow on mine. This is an amazing thing. <laughs> the amount that this black tank flush out will rinse out so if you can, you want to do that. But I just want to, listen guys, if you're in line and there's 10 people in line and you just need to dump and go, you, can, you don't have to do a black tank flush every time. Do it a little more next time. I like to do it when I'm at a full hookup site and I can take my time. I'll close it, let it fill it up a little, open it, you know, it's just. Now it's best if you can do it every time, but. It is. You know, if, if not. Mm -mm. No, you don't regulate that. Michael's talking Michael to us. Asked us. <laughs> <laughs> no regulator necessary on this. The higher the pressure, the better, frankly, yes. um, at, at, at that point in time. But that's a good question. And if we think of any questions, we'll try to insert them since we can't get them from you guys. And I, and I will say um, my, my opinion, and, and it doesn't really matter there, but I will, I will do the dump, the black and the gray, and then I will do the flush after. That's just the way I've always done it. I do so, the black and then I flush yeah. and then I do gray afterwards. But, but, it, it, but it doesn't matter. You can do it either way. Yeah. But so it's actually amazing. When you do this with a clear elbow, you can literally yeah. see to the point where it's running clear. Yeah. It's, it, it's truly, but you also see how much it leaves if you don't have one of these, yeah. which can be a lot. So. Uh, yeah, pretty question much. Question really quick, yeah. you guys. Mike just gave us a question of the year. Uh, we did get a question, and we will attempt a, uh, to do this. Um, but the question is, is, is the rule the same for motorhome tires? Yeah, and it, and it pretty much is. I mean, you're still, it's still a tire. The time frame you know, is the same. You're going you're gonna to get more wear probably on a motorhome tire. You will. Uh, yeah, you do have the, the chance of actually running, you yeah. know, doing and that. Yeah, you, you could run out the mileage in a motorhome tire. Um, I mean, we see it happen in our rentals. Yeah, uh, be, but the rentals are rolling all the time. They're not quite. Yeah, I mean, if you can put thirty thousand miles on a on a motorhome in less yeah. than five years, you might need tires. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So. you know. But I would I would just as the rule of thumb, uh, the five to seven years, and then uh, beyond that, it's going to be inspecting the tires. Yeah. I mean, if three years goes by and yeah. you're seeing dry rot in the sidewalls replace the thing and that's you know you we know? didn't really talk as much about the dry rod as we maybe should but the reality is is that the whole reason why we've said everything we've said is because it's the sun that damages right. these things more than anything sun, yeah, so sun if you can weather. cover them when you're storing them that's great yeah but you will get these little you'll see little cracks in the sidewall mm -hmm. and when you see that that's it you see those yeah. get new tires you yeah. will regret it if you don't the color I mean, starts fading in them they yeah. start turning brown you'll see cracks in them. yeah um, you also want to look up inside the tread yeah and see if you're seeing cracks down inside the yeah, bed. Yeah, that, that yeah. is absolutely indicative of needing to change tires. Everybody has always been pre-programmed that tires are always about tread and tread wear and tread depth. Well, on a trailer, yeah, it's totally different. 
Yeah. You know, so. because you're probably never going to drive that thing or pull that right. thing enough to wear that tire down. I mean, I'll be honest with you guys. The only time we've ever had to change that I know of that any of my clients ever had to change trailer tires because of wear is something was wrong that was causing yeah, yeah. the wear. Yeah. We had a bent axle. We had, you know, because if you yeah. hit something and you bend something, you know, you can load a trailer wrong and oh, get yeah. bad wear. Absolutely. So bad yeah. tire wear is usually caused by something that can be possibly fixed. Right. <laughs> right. You know what I mean? But needs to be looked at very, very, very quickly because yeah. um, you're scuffing a tire. It does not take long to... Uh, it doesn't. I mean, really not yeah. long, guys. I mean, so. <laughs> few hundred miles. I mean, if yeah. you've got a bent spindle, for instance, uh, in a few hundred miles, you can, you can wear that tire to where it's, it's almost bald yeah. on one side. Yeah, happens fast. Because all of that wear is going into one area as opposed to being spread out over the width of the tire. Yep. So. All right, so now we move down to, we got our power cable right here. Yeah, right? shortboard, yeah. Yep. This is becoming way more popular now. I don't even know of one now that we shove a cord in. Uh, Can you think yeah. of one? Not many. Seriously. Not many. Used to, in the old days, you guys, we used to literally have to take these cords here, and there was like this little box kind of behind here and this little opening. We'd have to shove the cord back in there, and it would hopefully wad itself up in this area sufficiently so that we could close the little hatch, right? Yeah. And, and if it was really thrilling in cold weather. I was going to say, dude, yeah. if it's cold, it's like wrestling a python, yeah. man. And, it, and on a 50-amp cable? <laughs> That's like what I mean, like, right? Yeah, like, uh, like you used to have on a, on a, on a uh, fifth wheel. Yeah. You're trying to shove that 50-amp thing oh into that Oh, my gosh, thing, dude. Or, it's, and it's and so... It's like, yeah. yeah. So this is what we call shore power. I do a little twist, pull. So and I and then I just put it up in my storage compartment. Yep. And it's what we call what is this, a twist lock. Yeah. Okay. And then once I do that, I can secure it with this ring right here. But right. I don't know. That, you know, I mean, I don't, typically don't find myself needing to do that. But some of these. Uh some of the covers will have a light on them to let you know that you're actually getting power. This uh, cable actually has, uh, yeah. oh, wait, no, it doesn't. Mine does, sorry. Yeah. Some, anyway. Yeah, some of them have it on the head of the, uh, yeah. the cable. Some of them have it on the cap. So this is an area, guys, where there's, you know, there, this is your, your vehicle's going to come with whatever power cable it needs. This has right. a 30-amp power cable. We've got one air conditioner. That's all we need. You might have a 50-amp power cable. It would be about twice as thick as this almost. And uh, it'll have uh, four prongs in there instead of three. It'll have four prongs on the plug instead of three. There's all kinds of adapters, you guys. I mean, we provide people with an adapter so that you can take this 30-amp plug and plug it into a 15-amp outlet, which is what you have at home. And that's fine. Don't run the air conditioner most of the time because right. it'll usually overload the home outlet. But you can do things like get your fridge cold, get your battery charged, use your lights and things like that yep. while you're plugged into a home outlet. It's very nice. There's even an adapter to go from 30 up to 50 just in case that's the only thing that's available. Right. There's a number of different things that you can put in line on this to monitor and protect the electrical system on board if you so choose. There's inexpensive things and there's very expensive things. Um, we're not going to get into it. We, we do whole classes on that kind of yeah. stuff. Um, that's, a, that's a future class. Yeah. So this know. also has a port here to where you can bring uh, cable TV or I'm not going to go into it in more than that. It's cable TV. I don't know what it's cable and satellite. Time, so. Check out our satellite school. Yeah. Um, but I don't, know, I don't know what this particular trailer is wired for, so I'm not going to mention satellite. Yeah, I was going to say this. I think I have a separate satellite loop, but it's pre-wired for uh, for a backup camera system. You'll see that in a lot, guys. I mean, kudos to the salesperson that talked into everybody putting that on the back of their trailer. <laughs> but it does make it really easy, and uh, it certainly helps backing up at night. I would say more than anything, because that's where I struggle more than anything, is when you're backing up at night, this thing doesn't have good reverse lights, nope. and it has night vision camera, and it's, it's great. It doesn't have any reverse no, lights. No, it does not. <laughs> I'm going to put some on. Yeah. But anyway. Um, and, and I mean, most of the seven ways don't have the, the reverse function. That's why they don't put them on. Mm -hmm. But you know, I'll put a separate there, switch. There is a place for the, in the seven way that you can hook the reverse lights on your vehicle and put reverse lights on. I'm literally going to do that to my camper. camper, you guys. It's so I just want some little square lights on my bumper so that I yeah. can see. Okay, but this has a uh, ladder, right? So the ladder is here because you should be inspecting your roof on a regular basis. And I like to, the, being in sales and you know, we, we, it's important to tell people, you know, your vehicle has a one-year comprehensive warranty, but um, it actually only has a 90-day warranty on seals and caulk. Okay, yep. and so what that tells me when it tells me that when the manufacturer says we're going to warranty the caulk for 90 days, 
that tells me personally that I should look at it every 90 days because yeah. that's their life expectancy of it. That's all they're guaranteeing me. So to me, that, guarantee, that tells me that if I look at it and everything looks fine, I'm guaranteed 90 days. I need to look at it again. Okay. And guys, this is the biggest thing. That, that's, if you keep water out of your camper, it'll last forever. If it gets in it, it's like an iceberg. By the time you see any damage, it has already probably done so much damage. And here's the problem. And this is the reality. This is a maintenance item. Yep. And whether we like it or not, we can argue it to the end of the earth, it's a maintenance item. So if you don't change the oil in your car and your engine blows up and you take it to the dealer, the dealer's gonna say, that's not a warranty item. You didn't change your oil. Right. You have to buy a new engine. When your camper gets water damage because we didn't maintain the seals and the caulk, it is not warranty and it is not insurance. It is, damn it, it is just, it's expensive. It's negligence. It's it, is. it is, it is. It's because we didn't do our maintenance. Yeah. It's just like not changing so your oil. So your, this- uh, Your camper sets outside most of the time. Yeah. Most of the time it's exposed to sun and yeah. rain and wind and, and everything else that's bad out there. And uh, so if you don't look at it for two years- Yeah. And maintain those seals and sealants, you know, Water's gonna get in it. It's and it's not hard. Damage. You're gonna look at this thing. You're gonna yeah. get up on the roof and you're gonna look. You're gonna see it. There's caulk all over the place. Yeah. But if something looks like it's got a spot or it's got been compromised or it's, it's, it's dried up and pulled back a little or whatever, Cracking. put more on. Yeah. We need to keep the water out. Right. That's the most important thing above and beyond anything else, really, if you wanna preserve this thing for long term um, and also preserve its value, frankly, because um, value of your camper is how much the camper's worth minus whatever it takes to fix it to make it worth that. <laughs> you know, yep. So we want to avoid that. It is a big deal. Get up there, look around. Roofs have special self-leveling caulk that you need to buy, that you should probably buy here. We have it here, um, but you use a certain type of caulk on most roofs. We use, what, silicone on the rest mostly and stuff? Silicone mostly on the sides and, and around the windows and doors and stuff like that. Yeah. And then we use a self-leveling or a non-sag, uh, non-self-leveling caulk on anything that uh, touches the rubber. So yeah, and it's a special formulation so that it doesn't do damage the rubber. Regular, uh, regular sealants can damage the... And uh, silicone won't stick to the rubber. Yeah, and it's useless. So, it doesn't even matter. It's like... Um, and don't, whatever you use, oh my God. don't spray Flex Seal all over the place up there. It doesn't work. <laughs> yeah, don't do that. <laughs> and it is a bear to get off when we have to go in and reseal your room. I know their commercial Please looks great, but do it. not do that. <laughs> so, um, okay, so now we're on the, uh, this would be our campsite side. You know, most of what we talked about was the business side, right? Right. Um, on this side, really, we've got an awning. Yeah. You know, and awnings have some rules. In my opinion. Yep. Um, this is a power awning. This one's, uh, it's big, it's nice. Um, awnings are cool, man, yeah. but they're also fragile and expensive, yes. all right? So an awning is a sunshade, all yes. right? It's not there to keep you dry in a rainstorm. Um, yes. That thing can fill up with water. Way fa and even if this one's got one that you can pull and dump, I can angle it. Some of them dump automatically. That's all great. But in but a it, heavy rainstorm, it is not going to shed yeah, that water. That quick water enough. adds it's up. It's going to build up on that fabric, yeah. and it's either going to destroy the arms, it's going to rip the fabric, or it's going to collapse that that main tube up there. And unless you have some serious tools with you, you are now stranded. Yeah. <laughs> so it is something that you know if it if the weather's going to be at all bad, and I'm not trying to like put a downer on the whole reason why you got an awning, but if it's going to be bad weather, you need to get that thing put away. Yes. Here in Missouri. We can get up in the morning, it can be a beautiful sunny day, and you go out on that boat you have, yep. and you are rushing home in the afternoon because you're about to die out on the water because there's about yep. to be a storm. I, and I, I can almost, I can almost <laughs> set my watch that at three o'clock there is going to be clouds and a popcorn thunderstorm come over Mark Twain Lake. Yep, and that first <laughs> gust of wind, before your automatic retraction thing yep. can even do anything, We'll wrap this awning up over the top of this thing, and now you're out for a couple thousand dollars, yeah. and you're stranded until you yeah. get that thing. You can't tow it with the awning out. Yeah. Trust me, and I've had couple, this is not fun. A couple fun. thousand dollars is just the damage to the awning. That doesn't even include yeah. potential damage to the to the trailer from the awning yeah. smacking in the side of it. 
punching a hole in it, you know? Yep. So, you know, it's, it's, <laughs> I, it's, it's just something that you just want to be conscious of what you're doing. It's not, it's a fragile, expensive item. And uh, don't, uh, ta you just got to be kind of careful with it, yeah. you know? Um, let's, uh, should we go in? Let's go on in. Let's talk about the step real quick. So you one of the about important the things about these fold down steps, they're great, they're solid, they're wonderful, we love them until we close our door and this part of the step is not fully down on our threshold and we now just sprung the hinge on our door. So I'll say that again, this part of the step needs to be setting flush on the threshold. This is for everybody out there that has one of these yeah. who's having, a, why doesn't my door close like it should? Like yeah. notice that this one, see this? Because we're sitting right now, because we're sitting on these so we don't damage our floor. Yeah. And so right now, this is actually raised up about a quarter inch, which is just enough to keep that threshold up and the door won't close. Yeah. If you go on Facebook, on the, no, on the Novo uh, Facebook pages, people complain that the doors don't work right. That's not it. Yeah. Their steps aren't being step. right. Step. <laughs> it's not having the steps set right. It's seriously, it's got to be, a, these, you know. Every one of these have adjustable legs in them. Yeah. So this one here actually has the, the little levers here. Uh, you pull these back, and then you can move the, yep. the leg up and down. So um, if we temporarily move this for a second, now when you go all the way down, that's going to take this. Now this is resting yep. on the threshold. And now look at that. <laughs> the yeah, door closes. Yeah, that's, that's pretty amazing how just that little amount can you know, do that. I mean, oh, that would have been funny. <laughs> Michael whispered in our ear, he said he would have laughed if the door was locked. We're very you know, blessed. We probably would have too. We would have too. the way we are. We, we, I don't know, if some of you guys, you probably, if you've watched regularly, you may have noticed, but um, we, we are very blessed to have uh, the owner of Byerly is very nice to allow us to have great technology to be able to provide this type of stuff to you guys. And we recently got little earpieces just yeah. like the big time, right? Yeah. So uh, that's, now we can, Mike can talk to us in our ear. He's actually. Now we look like a bunch of FBI agents. We did, don't we? Yeah. 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 But Mike is upstairs, a couple hundred feet away in the studio, and yeah. we are downstairs in the showroom doing this wirelessly so this is all um, we weren't able to do this two years ago so uh, lots of fun stuff yeah. so hope you guys are enjoying it moving Let's... up in the world right <laughs> all right now we're going inside okay so we'll kind of do this you guys in here and by the way our camera system we normally have a really fancy gimbal that um, we're not using today so if things are a little bit uh, rougher hey uh, sorry it's just Part of production. <laughs> um, Tell Cody to hold still. Right? <laughs> hey, you guys don't know Cody is standing here holding this camera that weighs a good, I mean, it's not, it's got a big old battery and everything, and he has to hold it for an hour right in front of him, so he's doing good. Uh, he's a big kid, big kid if you've seen him. So, All right, so we come in here, we're going to do kind of the same thing we did. Um, we'll go around the inside like we did the outside. Right here by the entry door, you'll just see that we have some switches up here. We've got our awning controls right here, awning light switch right here. There's a porch light switch. Main interior lights are right here. Um, and I got a bottle opener and some coat hooks. You know, the, Typically when you walk in, you'll have some sort of main light switch or something like that. Um, your awning controls and things like that. The other thing by the front door, there is a fire extinguisher. I always joke that it's the first thing you pass on the way in, and it's the last thing you pass on the way out when this thing's on fire. So, <laughs> and I don't know if you can see them or not, but all these lights all have individual push buttons. So even the ones that turn off with the switch up here, uh, if you're just sitting in the trailer at night and you just want to cut some of the light down, yep. you can just turn them on and off. And all LEDs, like Rick said, nowadays that's everywhere. Everything's all LEDs, which is wonderful. It helps that battery last even longer. Our entire draw on the system's even less. Um, you're less likely to overload your... Hey, real quick. Remember that 30 amp plug we're plugged into out here? 30 amps. There's all kinds of outlets in here, all kinds of appliances, and I promise you I can plug in enough stuff to easily overdraw 30 amps. There's right. nothing wrong with your camper. You run, you run <laughs> this, this... And that electric water heater out there, bang, you're going to trip that breaker. Yeah. 
And I've done that. Air conditioner's running, water heater's running, I kick on a coffee maker. High draw items. You get yep. three of them going. Well, I mean, yep. just think about it. It's only, you know, it's, it's like, think about this. Your whole camper is plugged into two outlets at home. So anything, you can overload that. There's nothing wrong with your camper. Part of camping, part of what we do is power management yep. and making sure we don't overdraw the available thing. So this is our definition of roughing it, people. Okay, I can't microwave <laughs> and make coffee at the yeah. same time. I'm gonna rough it and do one or the other. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I, mean, yeah, so. I, can't, I can't eat. I can't eat my McGriddle up and make a cup of coffee. Right. You know that that's roughing it in the RV business. Yeah. You know, but it's there. It's not. You know, everything's not. It's not all magic. Uh, it definitely, there are some rules, some parameters that we do have to go by. Um, something I'll mention just real quick because I see it on the ceiling right here. Smoke detector, everything's gonna have a smoke detector. There's a battery in there that needs to get changed every six months. You know, it's good to do it in the spring and maybe in the fall or whatever. Um, Rick, where's the rest of this stuff? Right here, uh, down here. Is it down there? Yep, okay. so uh, this right here is our, this is a CO, so carbon monoxide and propane gas detector right here. This is a little thing that I mentioned earlier, it's hardwired, right? Yeah. This is on all the time, no matter what, which is good because you'll blow up. If the, right. <laughs> I mean, right. so, you know, propane's heavier than air, so it's gonna sink, it's gonna right. pick that up down here. Um, if, even if you don't have a generator, maybe somebody else does. That carbon monoxide detector is important. Um, yeah. Carbon monoxide detectors go out for no good reason. They have expiration dates, yes. seven or eight years or something nah, like that. It's four years. Is it four years? So it's most of us. that they're replaced every four years. Now. Yeah, and it says it on the back, you know. So, but like this thing might just start beeping for no good reason. It will beep when your battery's too low. Yeah. Um, if it's not getting the power that it should, it will beep. But if everything's fine and it just starts doing its thing, it might be time to replace it if it's more than four, if it's four or more years old, because um, they, they do go out. Um, very, very important though that those are in your vehicle and they are working. On that note, we talked fire extinguishers, we talked detectors, emergency exits, pretty much anywhere there's a sleeping spot, you know, there's one over there, there's one right here, and then this, well, that's a door. <laughs> there's, there's an exit down yeah. here. So make sure that you are familiar with your emergency exits, where they're located, how to use them. Make sure your kids know how to use them so that they can get out. This thing is made out of glue and plastic, people. It's going to go up. You don't. You need out. So yeah. you've got outs. That's why they do this. Um, it doesn't have to, please do not let me scare you. I don't know any of my clients that have ever had one of these things burned down. Okay, right. so, <laughs> you know, we talk safety for the hope that we never have to do it, right, Rick? Right. You know. So the table, of course, makes down into a bed here to give you a small sleeping area there. Yep, and then up here, um, this has tank heaters. We're not gonna talk about that too much because not everything has tank heaters. We've got a monitor panel right here. When we were outside talking tanks, I mentioned that there's a way to find out. I've just got little buttons right here. I press them gray, black, fresh. And there's fresh. little lights right here. They'll light up and tell me how full my tanks are. And then battery right now is charging, so I got four good lights up here. Right here is my propane water heater switch. I turn that on, this little fault light comes on automatically. There's nothing wrong with it. That and that's only with a Suburban, though. All right. The fault light on a Suburban will stay on until it's lit. Right. Then it goes off. Now, if you have an Atwood... It does just the opposite. Uh, it we will not come on <laughs> unless you have an error. Right. Which so, means it doesn't light. Right. So you'll, have to, and you'll get the hang of that, and it is, of course, in the instructions booklets or whatever. Water pump switch is right here, too. Let me talk a little bit about that just real quick. We talked about being outside. You're connected to a city water connection. There's, you have to regulate the pressure. That's where you're getting your pressure, right? So let's say we filled the water tank. Yeah. So you've got your water tank full. To get your water pressure, you come in here, you turn this pump on. You probably hear that run right now. Yeah. So the pump is a 12 volt, which means it's battery operated. I don't have to have electricity for my pump to work. I can use it on the side of the road. I can use my bathroom. Yeah. Um, it's, it's an on-demand pump. On-demand, which yeah. means that it, I can leave this switch on all the time and nothing yeah. happens. When I open the faucet, water comes out, pressure in the line drops. Pump picks it up and starts running. Close the faucet, pressure comes back up, pump turns off. Right. So on-demand, on demand. you leave it on. I do turn this off when I drive because I'm afraid I'll loosen a connection and then it'll pump it all into my floor. <laughs> So I typically try to turn that off when I drive. I have had a plumbing connection come loose on the road. I didn't find, I found out when I plugged it into water when I got to my campsite and then I just hand tightened it because everything in here in the plumbing system is hand tight. It's no big deal. You know, that stuff happens. Um, but- um, Drag your house across the washboard, things are gonna come loose. Well, and you know what? That's, this is a perfect time to talk about that because you know, the reality is, is this thing is undergoing a hurricane and earthquake most of its life. It is a house on wheels. Yep. It is, you will tighten 
half the things on this thing over the course of its life, and that's perfectly normal. Yeah. And I just want to kind of put that into perspective, especially for somebody that's maybe never, ever had one of these, and you say, is this really right for me or not, okay? So the reality is, is that in the first 90 days, I mentioned caulk, the other thing that the manufacturer will do is they will pay us, they will pay Rick to tighten a screw in the first 90 days, yep. literally. Yep. So you got a screw came loose in the camper. You can go out to the storage lot, you can grab the camper, hook it up to your vehicle, you can bring it in here. Rick will walk out, he'll go over, he'll tighten the screw, you can take that thing back, put it away, go home, no problem. Yeah. Or you can go out and tighten the screw. That's, you won't void, void your warranty yeah. not doing that. And so that mentality of, you know what, I'm just going to tighten the screw. Nobody owes me anything and I'm not mad about it. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Because it's just a camper and that's the way it is. That's, our, that's the way we got to be thinking with these because that's the way it is. And it's fine and it's normal and it's fun and it's part of the fun and it's just what we do, you know? Yeah, um, it, things are going to come loose. I mean, doors, cabinet doors and stuff, you open and close them, they're going to come loose. Yeah. Don't be afraid to fix it. It's no big deal, guys. Yeah. You know, it's none of this is that hard necessarily or we wouldn't all be doing it, you know? Um, so right below our monitor panel, and a, a typical, it's, it's not uncommon for monitor panels to have your water heater and water pump switches built into them. That, that's very common. Um, below that, this particular vehicle has a digital wall thermostat that controls the air conditioner and the heat from one spot. There are campers out there where the air has controls right on it, and then there's a separate furnace control. Okay, this one has it all built in right here. Um, the, um, it's, uh, you on this one you toggle through i want to mention just a couple things about let's just talk about air and heat real quick you know um, heat's pretty simple we talked a lot about that out front with the propane this particular vehicle has a single outlet furnace right here this is a small trailer guys so my heat just comes out right here there are some vehicles that have it ducted in the floor okay and that's fine too this does have an enclosed underbelly but they use heat pads instead of ducted heat which other people use the passport last year will have ducted heat into a floor um, the Passport last year, if you want to look, it'll have ducted air. This one has digital wall thermostat, but a single air location because the vehicle is actually so small. I want to talk a little bit about running your, the, the heat's pretty straightforward. It will dry this air out. You will wake up in the morning and have chapped lips and stuff. It's normal. Um, the air conditioner, though, you know, here in Missouri, it is humid in the summer. Yeah. I mean, brutally humid, okay? And that creates a lot of condensation when you run an air conditioner, all right? This air conditioner has two speeds, high and low. That refers to the fan speed while the air conditioner is running. And I will tell you that you need to be running your air conditioner on high. Do not ever run it on low, especially around here. If you run it on high, you won't freeze it up. Yeah. If you run it on low, no matter where you're at, you're going to run the danger of freezing up the coils on the inside, it literally forms a solid block of ice and you will wait a painful, hot, long time for this to melt so that you can use your air conditioner again. And all you gotta do, run the thing on high fan speed when you're running your air, adjust your temperature so you're comfy, right. but don't try to run. Now the fan, you can run just a fan, that's fine. Yeah. Yeah. You know, but I mean, am I right on that? I yes, mean, it's, absolutely. it's you know, Absolutely. and let's other the one other thing I'm going to talk about about your air conditioner, guys. And this is part of part of being happy RVing is to have proper expectations. Do you know if you've got the wrong expectation, you're going to be disappointed when nothing was actually wrong. Right. It's just not the way it was supposed to work. So, an air conditioner. Okay. So here's our air conditioner right here. Right. This air conditioner has intake here and it blows out here. Okay. And it will blow out air. 20 degrees colder than what's going in, okay? So here's what happens. When you get to your campsite, it is 150 degrees in here, man. I mean, it is hot. Hot as all get out, hot. This thing's gonna start working, and it's gonna begin cooling it, and it's gonna take it a long time to work it down to a comfortable temperature, okay? Once it is at that, and you can help it, it's sunny outside, Pull your shades. It will help. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? It will yeah. help inside here. Oh, and I'm that talking door the, closed. That's the other thing, guys. Every time you open the door, it's going to let the hot air out, the colder in. Or it's sorry. Other way around. Yep. But, yeah. um, but you get the idea. <clears throat> uh, but there's certain, and, and I'm talking the brutal heat, man. When it's over, and, and think about that too. If it's over 100 degrees outside, and you're in full sun, yeah. and it's 80 in here, 
it's working. Yeah. It's working well, actually, at that point in time, yeah. frankly. You know? So that's a kind of a proper expectation thing. This is not a miracle worker. Yeah. It takes a while to get it down to temperature. You want to try to help it out by pulling shades, by minimizing. You just don't leave the door open, okay? It's like leaving the refrigerator door open. We're just not going to do that, you know what I mean? Um, and all that is is going to help, you know. And and it's, and I'm trying to just help you avoid coming in for a service call on something that there's nothing wrong with, because it happens all the time. People are like, oh, it's not working right. It's not working right. It's it's and they're going to come out, and the guy's going to take a heat or a little laser gun deal and going to hit the air going in, hit the air going out, and it's 20. Four degrees colder, and we're good. I mean, there's no warmth. There's nothing. It's just the way the thing works. The big difference is, is at home, we don't ever let our house get that hot. <laughs> yeah. You know yeah. what I mean? I mean, it's just it's always in that comfortable range where you like it. So it's never having to work it down like that. And you know also, what I mean? the air conditioner at home works on a totally different oh, gosh, type of yeah. system than what these work off of. I mean, it's the the concept is the same. You know, you're drawing air across the evaporator and cooling that air as it comes through it. The the difference is the efficiency level of your home air conditioner is much higher than what the efficiency I level of, <laughs> of this little air conditioner is. And guys, that's the thing, you know, this I mean you're this is this also costs one fourth, one third, one tenth, <laughs> whatever that home one did. <laughs> uh, well, I know, because I just put one in my house and I am it cost me $11,000. Like I said, this one is one tenth <laughs> the cost. <laughs> <laughs> oh my goodness, I'm sorry. All right, so we're going to quickly uh, go in and out of this little, this, this little bathroom here. A couple things I want to talk about just real quick in here. Um, Shower, shower head. This has a something called a shower miser. Watch for a video on this. We're going to do a video on that shower miser. But you know, let's say we're at the campground, and, or we're we don't have we have uh, water in our tank. We don't have a full hookup. So I've got a finite amount of water. When it's gone, it's gone. I want that water to last as long as possible. So the shower head here has a little shut off valve on. I've also, by the way, that water heater outside is six gallons. Okay. So it's, it's not like your home water heater. So I need that six gallons to last as long as possible. And I need my fresh tank to last as long as possible. So this little switch right here allows me to rinse. I can wet myself down, turn it off, soak myself up, turn it on, rinse myself off. You'd be amazed at how little water you can use to take a shower if you need to. So um, that's what that's there for. The shower miser takes that to a whole nother level, which is literally a video in itself, which we will get into one day. I will do a video on this. This is absolutely awesome. Um, the other thing that's in here is the charge controller for the solar, which we're going to talk about later. Um, the last thing we're going to talk about here is the solar. I, it happens to be right here. It's hard to see, so we'll show you a picture of it um, when we talk solar in a minute. Other thing here, the commode. So RV commodes, um, or antifreeze. Anytime you see pink stuff, by the way, guys, this is RV antifreeze. It's a non-toxic RV antifreeze um, that we use uh, to displace the water in the system so that we know things won't freeze, right? So the way that the RV commode works is it runs, it sits empty pretty much for the most part when I'm not using it. And when I'm going to use it, there's either a hand flush or a foot flush. And I'm going to take whichever one and pull it halfway, or I'm going to push this down halfway. And what that's going to do is that's going to allow water to fill the bowl without flushing it. I'm going to fill it up to wherever I need it. I'm going to use it. And then I'm going to fully push it all the way for flush and rinse. And I'm going to hold that down while it rinses it out for whatever I need. Toilet chemical goes right down there. That's how I get it into there. Okay, there's a straight shot usually right down into your black tank, just about. So, I mean, half the time you can like look down in there. So, um, this is, uh, it, but it's fill, use, flush. Toilet chemical right down the thing. I'll be the one to say it, and you can just, you can let all of your kids and everybody else watch this. People, use the amount of toilet paper that you need, do not use too much. If you have folks, if you're camping with, I, hey, I camp with girls. That's the deal, okay? Guys, this can clog. You need to have enough water in there to go with the tissue that goes in, and you need to try to just not overdo it, to be completely honest with you, because you can clog the system. It has happened. So um, if you do have a lot of folks that are using a lot of tissue, follow it with a lot of water. Um, because when you flush that toilet, it doesn't use a lot of water right then. You should let a little, I mean, just I just know this from experience. I'm not going to go any further than that, but <laughs> trust I, me on that. I, I, I will say, <laughs> if you look down in there, Dave was talking about opening the, the, the drain and the, the flush and, and looking down in there. 
if you can't see the plastic bottom of that tank, right, you've got a problem. Yeah, so <laughs> it's you know it's usually just That's, a straight shot. Real yeah. simple systems here, guys. Um, now uh, the refrigerators. I'm not gonna get too deep into this, other than this one's probably different than the one we did last year. There's all kinds of different fridges, guys. You've got gas electric. Um, you've got this is what we call d compressor driven DC, or yep. it, so this runs off of battery power actually. Right. And it's compressor driven, like at home. Mm -hmm. So let me just go back real quick. And there is an RV fridge operation video for RV fridges propane. That's gas electric. It needs to be level to work properly. It takes a long time to get cold. Yep. But it's kind of cool because it'll work on propane and battery. And it's, it's really efficient once it gets going. Okay. But it is very, very, needs to be level to work properly. Yeah. All right, and so then what you saw is we and started getting... I, and I would never call an RV refrigerator efficient. Okay. <laughs> uh, only because it uses very little propane. Was, uh, that, that, inter that, energy efficient, okay, I, I'll buy that. Yeah, one. he's but, right. Yeah, I would never call it efficient. He's right. Like, yeah. So then what happened was, is we're like, okay, cool. So you started to see residential refrigerators show up. We still have that in some of the bigger yeah. fifth wheels and stuff, okay? But the reality is that's not necessarily the best thing to go in an RV because it wasn't made for an RV, okay? It's yeah. great, it's big, it's huge, and it will work. Getting it worked on can be in can be challenging, and they may not anyway. So what we've got now enter the new compressor driven DC battery operated refrigerator. So it'll run on battery. New, new in the RV world. New in the RV world. They've been using these in like boats, in boats forever. Have they? Yeah. Well, been, that makes sense because it's never level for a long time. Or not always. Yeah. Well, it can. So this fridge is there's it's bigger. This is actually, this is the same physical size that an eight cubic foot RV fridge would take up. But, excuse me, this is 10.3 because it doesn't require as much mechanism on the back as the other one does. Right. Um, it's compressor driven, which means it doesn't need to be leveled to work properly, and it doesn't take a day to get cold. Nope. It gets cold very quickly, actually. Yeah. Um, two, I mean, an two hour. To, two to four hours. Even. It's gonna be it is cold. It two, gets cold. Operational. It is. It's faster than I thought it would be. Yeah. So, um, this is wonderful. Lots of different fridges out there, guys. So, um, the great thing about these, they don't use a whole lot of power. No, they don't. This, is gonna, this thing is going to pull about six amps compressor running. So, the compressor only runs when it needs to cool it. Right. So, the less, again, just like an RV refrigerator, the less you open and close the door, yep. the more efficient this machine is going to be. But, unlike an RV refrigerator, when you open and close the door, this one's going to cool off much quicker than an old RV refrigerator did. Well, an RV refrigerator has no fan, no compressor. It's like radiant right. cooling. It'd be like if you set a block in there it's, of it's, ice. It's called, <laughs> it's called absorption cooling. Right. Because it absorbs the heat out of the box. So every time you open that door, you no matter what the temperature is out here, you're letting heat, you know, because your, your refrigerator is going to be somewhere around 36, 38 degrees. You're not going to have your camper at well, 36, 38 degrees. It's going to be yeah. you know, whatever it is. This particular fridge, too, if you are running off of just battery, maybe we're boondocking. I don't have electric, all right? So yeah. I just got my battery, and I got my solar panel for during the day and stuff. There is a setting on this particular refrigerator right here that you tell it it's nighttime, it's, you're going to bed, mm -hmm. and it will go into a special mode for the next yeah. eight hours or whatever because it knows you're not going to open it, right. which makes it save even more energy. Yeah. It's actually Dead really cool. It's lighting down and everything. Yeah, it does. It's now, one of the important things about using these refrigerators, though, is just like your refrigerator at home, the cooling capacity still comes from the freezer section. So you want to make sure when you set your, your temperature settings, that the freezer is not set on five. Even though you want to get it good and cold, don't set the freezer on five. Otherwise, you're not going to get proper cooling in the refrigerator section. You can set the refrigerator section at five. It doesn't care. But if you set the, the freezer section at five, it's going to try to push all of the cold air into the freezer and not give you enough capacity in the fresh food compartment. Yeah, and if you like frozen lettuce. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, so but now we got in the kitchen, this particular vehicle has an exhaust fan that exhausts to the outside. If you have one of those, you should probably use it. It's nice. Um, and that helps a lot just keeping the inside clean. You know, well, you, it, it you does. You draw out a lot of that, that you know, stuff from cooking and, yep. and just 
you know. Oh, I should really. have mentioned this in the bathroom. That sure. reminds me. So another thing we like to do in here, we want to minimize the amount of moisture in the camper, period. Yeah. In every way, shape, or form, we have all kinds of damp rid and stuff. There's things that you can put in here to absorb it. Um, and there is an exhaust fan in your bathroom for the reason so that you can pull, you don't want all that steam in here. You don't want, for the same thing here, all the th everything that I'm cooking and stuff like that, it's going out, it's not accumulating, it's not getting dirty, it's just a lot nicer. Um, this is a, so this is our main propane device when we're not using our furnace, huh? Um, most, it's very, very, very typical for campers to have just propane stoves. This has a two burner, you'll see three burner ones. Um, you get up into some higher end motorhomes and stuff. Yeah, there's some fancy stoves yeah, and everything. Stoves, yeah. yeah, but really, until you get up into a motorhome with a generator, you're not going to have an induction stove. Nor would you want one because <laughs> you could. This I can use. And now, you know, guys, let's see. Let's let's. I want to. This just reminds me. Let's back up a tiny bit here and just say there are certain things that so much of this camper will run without being plugged into electric. There's only a few things on here that you have to have electricity for. The main thing is air conditioning. Yep. You have to have electric for air conditioning, okay? And the microwave. And the microwave. Those two things. Everything else, everything else in this camper, this one, the TV and some, most campers, your TV needs regular electric, okay? Mm -hmm. So your TV, your air conditioner, and your microwave. That's it. Everything else will run off of battery or propane in some way, shape, or form. The lights are battery. Mm -hmm. This thermostat is battery. Yep. The fan in the furnace is 12 volt battery. The propane, the ignition of the propane is a 12 volt piezo igniter. The refrigerator is 12 volt. The water heater is propane. The pump for water is battery. Everything on this thing except for air, for, or air, microwave, and this one has a 12 volt TV. Most of the time, TV needs to let everything else works. That's part of the fun. That's what's cool. I mean, literally, my wife never had to use a gas station bathroom again yeah. because we would pull up, I would get gas, and she'd come in and she'd use this one. Why not? I carry a little water. I don't carry full water, but I carry enough to wash my hands and use the commode. And it's got battery power, and it's got, I mean, it's just, it's great, you guys. You stop, you have lunch on the side of the road, it's really nice. I mean, it just, it's, you know, there's so many great things about having something so self-sufficient like this, you know. Um, but all that being said, that also means you got to take care of that battery. Yeah, you do. Yeah. You know, now, uh, this particular vehicle, so microwave, again, you need regular electricity. We all know how to use a microwave or we would have starved to death by now. Um, <laughs> <laughs> this this particular vehicle happens to have a convection microwave, so you can actually bake in it. It's cool. Um, we're not going to. This has a central vacuum. We won't talk too much about that because that's not something that is in everything. Um, certainly is we nice. We're going to talk about this though. <laughs> so we were looking at this. <laughs> I know. I was ago, like, wow, look at this. <laughs> and uh, they were noticing it that it had this rubber hose up here, and they couldn't. They were trying to figure out what was going on with it. Well, the professional RV tech just come over and did that. <laughs> that's all right. So, so this has the sprayer that it pulls out, and then you can. That's do that's the a good rule, okay? Instead of having something that that pulls down underneath like yeah. you're so used to. That's called don't force anything unless you know you should, because you will break a lot less things that way. <laughs> like if I need to tighten certain valves on my plumbing at home, I call my cousin the plumber because I'm afraid I don't need, he knows exactly how tight you can go before it becomes a gusher. So anyway, um, so let's, uh, we won't talk too much on TV on this. Some things don't even come with them. Most of the time you have to get your own. I would tell you this, if you need to get a TV, get a smart TV because a lot of campgrounds have Wi-Fi. You can connect your TV right to the campground Wi-Fi and watch whatever streaming services you are already paying for and more and more of us are going to streaming anyway yeah. versus uh, you know we almost everybody has netflix on their phone seriously or, or whatever or if you're paying for at and yeah. uverse if you're paying for spectrum they all yeah. have an app you have access to the stuff you're yeah. paying for in an app so yeah. it's you know and even now you know and people have data plans that can accommodate it so yeah. frankly it's a the satellite's not dead yeah. but Sure, it, hit. I'll tell you what, most of us can get by with what we can get mm -hmm. from streaming, what we can get through the campground Wi-Fi or the cell network. You know, I mean, even Johnson Shuttons has a cell site now. I was amazed. That was great. <laughs> but, well, as long you know, as I get Valley Sports for my Blues games. See? Well, you know, 
everything's good. It was so funny, man. I don't know if I ever told you about this. I borrowed one of the Allegros one time, and we went down to Echo Bluff two weeks after it opened, right? And uh, we get down there. Echo Bluff State Park's great, man. Somebody laid a piece of fiber to this place, dude. They have high-speed Wi-Fi at this campground. Mm, nice. And when we got there, the Summer Olympics were going on. And before I even got the camper set up, the motorhome set up, Rachel had the TV on, Netflix on. You were the last person to use it, and you were still signed in. I go, give me the remote, because I was going to watch a bunch of fun stuff for you. Uh, but she would not let me, lucky for you. Uh, but uh, that was so funny. <laughs> I was like, oh, look, Rick's count. <laughs> Could have happened. Anyway, though, but yeah, seriously, just streaming through the TV. But, I mean, like I said, Rachel had the Olympics streaming through the TV, through the campground Wi-Fi, before I had Jack's down and electric plug in. <laughs> you know what I mean, it was literally like that easy, that fast. Um, and it was pretty cool. So now, uh, one of the reasons, the main reason why this vehicle was chosen is because the no boundaries from Forest River comes from the factory with a complete solar system. And what I mean by a complete solar system is solar panel. There has to be this thing called a controller to manage the power into the battery, mm -hmm. a battery, and then an inverter to take our 12 volt battery power and make it electricity. So on this vehicle here, hopefully, do we take pictures of this right now? Yeah. Hopefully you guys are yeah. seeing a really cool picture yeah. of the inverter. So underneath this couch, show me underneath the couch real quick. This inverter right is down here, okay? Underneath the couch, you can see it right here. But there's actually a switch right here that I can turn that inverter on, okay? An inverter takes the battery and takes battery power and inverts it and makes alternating current regular electricity out of it. It's not going to run this. Absolutely It's not, not. going to run that. This particular vehicle has a 1,000 watt inverter. It is connected to every outlet in here. So I, when I'm sitting not plugged in, I can plug in a TV, my laptop, anything like that, and my 1,000 watts is going to handle that. If I upgrade to a 2,000 watt inverter, okay, now my, I can certainly draw off the battery a lot faster, so I'm not going to get, you know, your battery is your fuel tank for this little escapade, and it's constantly getting this charge from the, from the solar panel, but it's, it's also it draining, much. right, yeah. it drains a lot faster, you know, yeah. but if I had a 2,000 watt inverter, I could brew a cup of coffee over here, okay? There are vehicles on our lot that have multiple lithium batteries, 3,000 watt inverters, and it literally will run the air conditioner. If I wanted to do that in this vehicle, I could upgrade the batteries to lithium batteries, I could upgrade the converter, and I could upgrade the entire system, and I'm not joking, that's eight to $10,000, because I would need more panels than I can even fit on the roof. If I wanted to do it in this vehicle, so right now, we'll show you a picture, there's a 200 watt solar panel on the roof. That thing's pretty big, it's pretty awesome. And that's gonna keep that battery maintained for lights and fans, and even this, air, even this on a sunny day, you know? Um, the solar panel goes to a charge controller. So we can show you a picture of the charge controller that was in the bathroom. So what the charge controller is doing is it's monitoring the battery. And if the battery needs a charge, it allows charge in. Yeah. But if the battery is full, it just sits and floats and doesn't right. allow the solar right. panel to overcharge a right. battery. You right. must have something between a panel and a battery to, because you can't just constantly feed unlimited power into a battery. Now, <laughs> you in know? this case right now, we're, we're plugged in, so the converter is actually giving us the power. Yeah. If we were not plugged in and boondocking, as we limitedly talked about earlier, then the solar panel would be what was giving us power to charge that battery. Thanks for mentioning that. You guys, the battery on the front of this thing charges in multiple different ways. Anytime you're plugged into regular electricity, that there, this, oh, here. Every camper has one of these things. Yep. Sorry. Fuses power. and circuit breakers. <laughs> the heartbeat. Of yeah. camper, right so there. somewhere in your camper you have fuses and circuit breakers so that that way if um, first thing you check when something's not working <laughs> is right here you know um, but uh, this right. guy has a built-in battery charger so yes. it's monitoring the battery correct and it's charging the battery if it needs right. to your vehicle may or may not have a hotline on it in the seven way that will also provide battery maintaining power mm -hmm. it can charge uh, but um, it's a good maintainer as you drive down the road. And then you got a solar panel on the roof that as long as sun is shining on it in any way, shape, or form, it will provide power to the battery. If it needs it, if the charge controller says, yeah, the battery could use some juice, yeah. and then it'll let it in. And then the inverter is connected to the battery and it pulls off the battery. 
You know, and these solar systems nowadays, guys, you can take it as far as you want. With, if you have, with time and money, we can do darn near anything. It doesn't matter how much of both you have. Um, but um, realistically, to upgrade, to run an air conditioner, and you won't even run it all night for 10 grand, but it's possible. I mean, to make it to where it runs. If you have something out there like what we have on our lot that's got 300 amp hours of lithium batteries and a 3,000 watt inverter, that's enough to run that air conditioner to cool the whole place down. You know? One air conditioner. Yeah. Oh, yeah. It's only connected to and, one. And you're only and you're only going to get about. Uh, you won't get an hour. I don't yeah, think out of it. You're going to get about an hour of runtime. Yeah. Out of it, about an hour. And continue. Yeah. You know. So it's like, <clears throat> it's just not there at this point. You know, I mean, I still have a generator portable I will use. Um, I can't rely yet on that, um, and it was much more economical at this point. But the cool thing is, though, is it is, I will say this, and I mean, I'll just, you know, I, at this point, I mean, I have one of these, and it is cool. It is really, really cool to have a solar system. Um, I didn't realize how cool that was going to be until I had it. Yeah. Um, but it, it really is neat. It's really nice to not have to disconnect my battery when, I'm, mm -hmm. when it's sitting. I feel like that's like almost my favorite part about it is with a, just a 200 watt system like what's on here right now, it allows me to, I don't have to worry about disconnecting my battery. It's, my battery is always charged and the vehicle is like always ready to go and, in and that that's, respect. That's you know? something that we preach in, in all of my other classes to, to where we do uh, maintenance and stuff, you know, the winter get ready and uh, spring get ready and stuff. You know, we preach the battery, maintain the battery, take care of the battery. Well, in this particular trailer, and those that are like it, that solar system is helping to protect that battery by keeping it charged. That's the most important thing for the battery. The This trailer does not run on a battery. Right. It runs on a converter when it's plugged in. It's not drawing power from the battery. Right. You know? The only time it draws power from the battery is when you're not plugged in. Did you guys catch that? So, just to clarify that, when you are plugged into regular electricity, all of the 12 volt battery operated things, this box is converting. Invert goes from battery to electricity. Right. Convert converts electricity to battery. Correct. So this and thing that has here has absolutely nothing to do with the inverter. At all. <laughs> that inverter is only used when I am not plugged in at all. Correct. I mean, it, you know, even though the light's on right now, it is doing nothing, nothing, nothing. <laughs> right. You know, but... Um, all, your, all your outlets are being powered. It's going through that. Yes. It's just it's passed through. It's just passing through. Yeah. So all of it is being powered from our shore power at this point. Yep. So the one thing you need to remember about that inverter, all right, and this is just very simple math, approximately 10 to 1 so for every one amp that that has to create, it's using 10 amps of battery power. You got one battery out there that is an 85 amp hour battery. It ain't gonna last very long. This is why your 300 amp hours but, don't last very long with air conditioners. Yeah, but you've also got the solar panel putting power back into it. Now, if you're using every outlet in here to plug things in, you're probably not gonna keep up with the power requirement, but if you got your phone charger, you know, and maybe you're watching TV or something like that, and you got a couple of, you know, your phone or your computer, something like that plugged into a couple of the outlets, the solar panel on a good sunny day should pretty much keep up with the power demand. Yep. And to give you guys an idea, I've already looked into this, and if I was going to do this, and if I wanted to run my air conditioner and really be as awesome as off-grid and lithium and incredibly self-sufficient as I possibly could, I would go out and I would buy two 250 amp hour batteries that are two grand a piece. I would buy a 3000 watt inverter that has an automatic transfer switch in it. I might even buy a hybrid inverter that can use the outlet and the battery at the same time. And then I would cover my roof. I could put four, I could add three more 200 watt panels up there. And then I would actually buy two more 200 watt panels to set outside and plug in because it can handle two panels through its outside plug on this vehicle as well. I would need a total, I would get six 200 watt panels, I would have 500 amp hours of battery, and I would have a 3000 watt inverter, and that's barely getting there, man. <laughs> and that's 10 grand. I mean, no joke. It, it really is. I would love to do that, but I just can't right now. You know, and if you, it, but it's possible, and you can, and it's cool, and that would do it, man. 500 amp hours with a 13.5 and a 3000 water and 1400 watts, 1200 watts of solar. That would do it. That would give me 
what I need. But it would have to be at that level to be anywhere. That wouldn't give me what it's like to be plugged in. Yeah. It'd be close. I mean, it would be as good as you could possibly yeah. get, really, just about today with today's what's available in technology. And, you know? and of course, you're still limited on the time that you're able to run that stuff. That's what I, yeah, I can't run the air like it like I'm plugged in at a campground, no matter what. I don't, there are not enough solar panels on Earth to do that at this point. <laughs> We're going to talk a lot more about that in about, uh, what, three schools? I don't remember. Yeah. Uh, power systems, I power. think, is April or May. I can't what is next school, Mike? No, boondocking. Next power, school is boondocking. Power systems, yeah. When we do power systems, we'll talk a more, lot more about solar and everything else. Yeah, that, so we'll have a school. That's the last school. Is in, that the last is one? That, is that May or April or May, Mike? Okay, so that'll be the April school. By the way, the uh, school syllabus, the schedule is available on www.buyerlyrv.com. Um, but uh, we will do a whole, po Rick will do a power systems, um, a whole class on that. Yeah. You know, and that's where a lot of what we did today is very much an overview and almost every system or every section of this presentation can have a whole class on it. And there are some that we will do that. Yeah. So, you know. And, you know, as we go forward uh, into this year, some of the service tips and stuff may be on some of these little accessory type items. Yeah. You know, we're trying, we, we tried uh, a little bit last year to do uh, some actual videos uh, and show some things, how they operate and stuff like that in some of the service tips instead of just me standing there and talking about maintenance, 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 which I'm still going to preach. Because that's because that's we owe that to you. If we about. don't do that, we yeah. are doing you a disservice. Right. So, <laughs> just, yeah, you know. we, and, and, and I will never stop stressing: you have to take care of these things. Yeah. They are not maintenance free at all. You know, and, and that's the thing, guys. And that's at least you don't have to do the maintenance on them. As as the customer, you don't have to do the maintenance, but you have to look at them or have it looked at, and you have to do that on a regular basis. And that's important, you guys, because we live in this like maintenance is free society. Yeah. I mean, you buy an automobile nowadays, there is a good chance that all you will do is change oil, maybe. And you if you have to have the thing safety inspected for 10 years I know. or 150 You know, you miles might now. put a set of brake pads on this thing. Yeah. You might put a set of tires on it. Yeah. But vehicles are almost maintenance free. This is not a maintenance free vehicle. Not even close. There is a lot of work that we do on these things all the time as owners. You know, if you you can't just let them sit, you can't just let them you know, even when it's in storage, I'm going and checking on it because if that plastic vent breaks and water starts coming in, I don't want to wait two months to find out later. Yeah. You know, you, you really got to keep an eye on it. It's yeah, you what, might be able to walk through the aisles after the wood finish is swelling. If something dude, like it's that something that, and that's, you know, we, you know, and that's something that we see all the time is folks just don't get out to the camper. And then when they do, it's a disaster, yeah. you know, and it's too bad. Having, used to happen all the time with pop-ups, man. Oh, my oh gosh, no, dude. Man. I just go out there in like a mouse hotel and everything else. <laughs> you know, I mean, it was just really bad. Yeah. So, um, and I'll, just a couple things, you know, uh, before we finish up here, just to keep you guys up to speed here at Byerly RV, do make sure that you are following us on Facebook, subscribe to the YouTube channel, and um, go on our website and register for email. Uh, if you truly want to keep up with everything that's going on around here, I'd love to be able to call everybody, but we just can't. We put stuff on the website. We send out emails. We put it on Facebook. We put it on YouTube. Um, and we certainly want you guys to be able to keep up with stuff. So uh, that's by far the best way. I don't want anybody to feel like they have missed anything. Um, you know, so we try to put all this stuff out on a lot of different channels yep. you know, and things like that. We've got a lot of stuff going on this year. Um, 2023, uh, we are celebrating, this I should have led with this, we are celebrating 75 years in business this year. Uh, Byerly RV uh, was started in 1948 by a guy named Walter Byerly, and he started by making these things uh, by hand here in mm -hmm. Kirkwood, Missouri. We currently have three original Byerly trailers built by Walter. Um, the family that owns Byerly RV now purchased it off of Walter a very long time ago, and we are currently have the third generation of the same family owning and running the business. Byerly RV was started on parts and services, what we built this company on. Um, I can talk for hours on that, but you know we are currently expanding. Uh, we have purchased property next door. We are building an 88,000 square foot indoor storage facility and a 16 base service facility. Yes, we could have built a brand new gleaming showroom up on that hill, but no, because that's not what this industry needs. You know, how many dealers out there are like, oh, we can't work on it if you didn't buy it here. You know, they didn't even have enough people to even work on the stuff they sold. Okay, but the reality is, is that if you bought a camper from your neighbor, and you need it worked on, you got to be able to go somewhere. Yeah. 
Yeah. And when you come here to buy the RV and you get good service, okay, well, what does that mean? Well, next time I'm going to shop for a camper, I'm probably going to go look there. Yeah. You know, but that's the whole idea, guys, is that this business, everything we've talked about, you know, the maintenance of this and the that, it also, so, you know, these things break. And your home dealer, you need to be able to get service. Yeah. And you need to be able to get it in a timely manner. And that's where we're putting, you know, we've always promised you guys good after the sales service. And we are willing to put our money where our mouth is. We are building just, it's just beautiful. And also we have outside storage. You know, how many times in the last two years being in sales have I heard somebody walk out of me? I can't even buy it because I don't even have a place to put it right now. All the, all, the, yeah. all the places are full and they are. I mean, so that's fine. Okay, here you go. You know, indoor storage is hard to find. I mean, it's just hard to find. We have climate controlled indoor storage now. It's not cheap. 12 month contract. So, <laughs> but hey, you know what? It's if you've got a half million dollar motorhome, why not? You know, it ain't that much. Makes sense. Absolutely, you don't have to winterize it or anything. You know, it also happens to be conveniently located at the best service center around. <laughs> so, you know, I mean, there's all kinds of reasons. There, it, 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 and uh, but we we just we're always trying. We've always asked ourselves, what else can we do? And we commit that to you guys. You know, we ask ourselves that every time we do this. We ask ourselves that all the time. You know, campouts are back on. Everybody's waiting for a campout announcement, which I should have already made, so I do apologize. Uh, we're camping in April, though, guys. It's coming. I don't want to make the announcement this very second because I wasn't going to do that today. So let's just say let's pay attention to the February 1st monthly update for a campout announcement. Um, I will give you... Just, just remember, it is in April. Yeah, February 1st, I will give you guys um, campout dates, and we will be opening reservations uh, almost immediately so that everybody has plenty of time to plan and we'll do another one in September as well. But the reservation is made for April. It is on. We are doing it. It is going to be awesome. Uh, we can't wait. Fall was great. It was a warm-up. It was small. That was fun. Um, but we had a lot of fun, and it got us warmed up for spring. Spring is going to be just awesome um, and big and fun, and just we can't wait. I've got Blue Springs Ranch, the whole place I've basically got already reserved. It's going to be awesome. If you guys have never checked it out, Blue Springs Ranch is a great place to go. And we've been going there for years for our camp out. But um, that is, that's happening. Um, and uh, let's see, we've got our show this weekend. for the, And then, of course, we've got um, auto, or the, the RV show coming up at the end of January. So we will be down there for sure. It'll be great. Um, and, uh, you know, if, but if you would prefer to shop in comfort, come on out this weekend. Pre-show pricing. It's great. You guys, um, as always, so we're starting, we're in the second semester now. Yep. <laughs> so uh, we'll, Welcome you know, we've, new year. yeah, and uh, we're always looking for, um, you know, ideas. So if you guys have any ideas of anything that you would like us to do a school on, we will not do driving school. So anything yeah. other than driving. Service um, tips, too. Yeah, um, if you have service tips, something you, know, you want to know about. Little, yeah, Little tidbits that, uh, you know, we can, uh, Michael and I can shoot a video on or something or, you know, if it gets longer than that you know michael and dave can go out and shoot something yeah there. let us know you know if there's any if there's anything we can be providing you guys that we are not you know um it's it's certainly what we like to do so i'm gonna say i'm gonna expand a little bit here real quick on what dave was saying um the the owner of this company warren Patton, has committed a great deal of resources to expanding the service department of this yeah. company to make it as good as it can possibly be. We are training techs. We have a complete department now that is dedicated to training our techs. We are in the process of PDIing stuff that we have on the lot. So it's gonna be ready to go when you come in to get it. We're not there yet, but we're working on it. All right? Yep. Um, it's all retail progress. Retail service, everything that 16 bay building that Dave just mentioned is retail service over there. So we are making a huge commitment to you, the customer that needs that retail service, the service after the sale. That's not just warranty service. That's the guy that's had it for 10 years that needs, you know, to have something done. Um, Maybe you just I want a good accessory yeah. and don't want to have to wait three yeah. months to have it put on. Yeah. <laughs> and I wish you I know. could give you more details about my visions for expanding uh, some of our service offerings, but we're not there yet, but I hope to be able to announce some of that uh, in the coming months. Um, this is what's going to allow us yeah. to do that. We are currently, guys, one thing is, is that when you do this, we got to staff this place. And so we have been actively hiring. And yeah. um, if you or somebody you know 
thinks that this would be exciting and fun. If you want to be a carpenter, an electrician, a plumber, all yeah. at the same time, work on fun vehicles and hang out with cool yeah. people and have a good time and work in, in an industry where we literally sell fun. Yeah. Um, you're, a, you're a handyman. Uh, you've gone to school for, for building maintenance trades, things like that. You meant to tech um, school, yeah. whatever. Okay. You guys, we have a full mm -hmm. training program here. Yeah. You can come in here and you can get trained for a career a yep. career where, let me tell you something, and I have said this for the 17 years I've been in the RV business, there have never, ever, ever been enough RV techs no, in the world. There are automotive techs everywhere. Everywhere, everywhere. Yeah. There are not a lot of RV techs, and there's not a lot of good RV techs, period. Anywhere. Maybe some of you have shopped at humongous nationwide places with the worst service you've ever had. That's what I'm talking about. Because if you come into a town and you open a business, you got to hire what's left. Everybody who's already quit, got fired, or whatever. To find and keep good people, to develop good people, it's your bit. It's everything. Your people are everything. And if, if, if you're interested in something like that and you can make a commitment like that and this sounds like fun, come on up. Come yeah, talk to us, come you know. Talk to us. Um, but, uh, but truly, here at Byerly RV, that's what you're going to find that may be different than everywhere else. Yeah. You know, and uh, it's, it's, it's uh, just because you've got the biggest name and spend the most money and make the most noise means nothing in this business right. at all. So, um, and I don't mind saying that because I'm tired of, of, of people having bad experiences when they shouldn't have, and now they don't want to RV anymore because they should have been here and had a good experience like you should have had. And if you know somebody like that, send them in. Yeah. They shouldn't have had a bad experience. If you've had a bad experience, do not let that ruin your future. Come here. We will take good care of you. We will show you what a good, what your home dealer should be, how you should be treated, and the things you should receive when you do this. You know, I mean, for a lot of our clients, it goes <laughs> wedding, birth of child, retirement, and this. It's that high up in life events, you know, to buy this thing, you know, and it is a big deal. And if yeah. you didn't get good service or you haven't had a good experience, you need to come here. It's fine. Get over here. We'll trade you out of what you have and get you in something here. No big deal. You know, it's this is the place to be, you guys. We, it's, it's, that's, it's the just. your life. Seriously, you know, and um, so. And uh, for the rest of our lives, hopefully, anyway, right? <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, you know, uh, so anyway, um, thanks for watching. I mean, I don't know. You got anything else? I don't. This is the part where we just kind of start to ramble, so we'll stop. Um, and uh, any, But seriously, communicate. You guys have ideas, let us know. You want to talk to either one of us, you can literally call up here and ask for Rick or Dave. That's fine. We're around. It's no big deal. Almost He's a lot is. busier than I am. <laughs> I'll be honest almost every day. <laughs> Poor Rick has to <laughs> literally just deal with every single thing that happens in the shop. I'm lucky. I just make videos and it's cool stuff. So, <laughs> so I'm, a, I'm probably a lot easier. I'm a lot easier to get older than Rick. But you know, if you actually need like serious engineering knowledge, then you probably need to talk to Rick. But I can tell you how to dump your tanks. Anyway, <laughs> I don't know, man. Listen, guys, thank you so much for watching. As always, we've been doing this Byerly RV thing, university thing, for a few years now, and we try to at least bring you a little something more every time, have a little bit of fun. Uh, for those of you that watch all the time, you know who you are. Thank you. Thank you thank very, you. very much. We really, truly do appreciate it. Um, and for you, those of you that are new, thanks for watching. If you watch this whole thing, wow, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> we appreciate that, too. So, I don't know. Right? Yeah, you could have... Just about done a whole hockey game at this point. Have we? <laughs> <laughs> well, guys, thanks, uh, thanks a lot. I'm Dave. I'm Rick. We'll see you next time. Good night.